Thanks. Okay. If I speak in the tongues of men or of angels, but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have a faith that can move mountains, but do not have love, I am nothing. If I give all I possess to the poor and give over my body to hardship that I may boast, but do not have love, I gain nothing. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. In the middle of the 
storms of this life I won't turn back, I know you are near And I will fear no evil For my God is with me And if my God is with me Whom then shall I is coming for the heart that holds on a glorious light beyond all compare and there will be an end to these troubles but until that day comes we'll live to know you here on the earth and I will fear no Thank you. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. Our next song is our offering song. So I invite you to pray, prepare with me in your hearts through prayer to give of our, our tithes and our offerings. Pardon me. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for everything you've done for us, for the ways that you will provide for us today that we haven't even yet seen.
we want to give you these gifts back as a way of worshiping you for everything you do. Please help us to use them wisely as a church to the benefit of your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. that song but how many of you have gotten to a place this last week where you felt like you didn't have anything more to give and still needed to give more praise the Lord that he giveth and giveth and especially the line that says um, when our strength has failed when the day is only half gone yeah <laughs> I said an amen right there let's pray Lord we thank you so much that you have something to feed us this morning for our souls we pray that you will help us to open our minds and our hearts, receive whatever it is that you have for us, whether encouraging or challenging, to know that it's the food and the energy that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Kids, you can come up on the stage for the children's message with Pastor Brock. And after the children's message, you can go back to sit with your families or you can go to children's church.
Well, Tommy, I see you have your cowboy hat on still today. Did you forget to take it off? You know it's not Western Day today. It was last week. No. Well, last week you were talking about being a cowboy. Did you decide to be a cowboy? No, not really. Well, why do you have your cowboy stuff on? Because I'm going to be a missionary to the cowboys. <laughs> you are? Well, how come you had to dress up like a cowboy? Well, you, if you're going to be a missionary, you've got to dress up and look like the people. And also, I've been practicing my cowboy accent, too. You have? Let me hear it. Get along, little dog, just get along. <laughs> hey, there. How you doing? <coughs> My name is Tommy. I'm a cowboy. Y'all got some grits to eat? And y'all got some beans and bacon? So, you're dressed like a cowboy, you're acting like a cowboy because you're going to be a missionary to the cowboys, huh? Now, where did you get that you had to dress up like people and, and, and have an accent like people to be a missionary? I got it from the Bible. You did? Where? I got it from the Apostle Paul, the greatest missionary ever. You did? Well, I don't remember him saying you had to dress up like a cowboy to reach cowboys and have a cowboy accent. Well, not really, but you got to interpret the scriptures a little bit. You can't just read it like you do every Sunday. <laughs> okay, now what scripture are you talking about? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 through 23, and I just happen to have it right here. Okay, you want to read it for me? Okay. It says, Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law I became like one under the law, although I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law. Though I am not free from God's laws, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having to the law. To the weak I became weak, to win the weak. I have become all things to all people so that all possible means I might save some. I do this for the sake of the gospel that I may share its blessings. You see what I mean? What? It says you become all things to all people so that you can win them. Well, I don't think that's talking about just how you dress and, and how you have your accent. I, I suppose you could dress like people if you wanted to reach them. If you go to another country, it wouldn't hurt to dress like the people out there. But the thing I think is Paul was talking about was that when he became like other people, he, he blended in with the culture, became part of the culture. Yeah, and I'm blending in with the cowboy culture. Okay, all right. If you want to wear a cowboy outfit and so forth, I think that's okay if you want to reach the cowboys. It might help you to blend in with the culture a little bit. But the accent, that accent sounds really fake. And I think you need to be genuine and real. And if you're going to tell people about Jesus, you need to speak from your heart and not have like a fake accent. Okay, I'll get rid of the accent. I didn't like it much anyway. But you understand that to be a missionary, you have to relate to the people that you're reaching out to. You have to listen, and you have to become their friend and be part of their culture. I understand that. But you don't have to sin, Paul says. No, you don't have to sin. But you have to form a relationship. That's right. You know, I think you got something here. I think you found a missionary principle here from the Apostle Paul. Yeah. So remember that if you have friends that need Jesus, you need to be their friend and you need to listen to them and understand them. And then you can reach them and tell them about Jesus. That's a good, good point. Thank you. I'm glad you had the kids' message today. And you can wear that cowboy stuff as long as you want to. Well... I might wear the hat if it's sunny, but this bandana gets hot and itchy after a while. You can take it off if you want to. I think you could still reach cowboys, even if you're not dressed like a cowboy, if they know that you love them. Okay. 
Thank you, kids, for listening. You can go to your class now. We're back to be with your parents. Mom, did you make a mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we are. I was reminded about how important church history is in the last week. Um, there's been a big dust up because President Obama at the National Prayer Breakfast uh, made some statements about history, actually church history. He, he mentioned that we as Christians should get off our high horse and not criticize the things that happen over in the Muslim countries because he said there a lot of people have done a lot of things in the name of Christ and he mentioned the crusades and he mentioned uh, slavery and, and those other kinds of things and you know it is true that um, a lot of people who say they're Christians have done a lot of things in the name of Christ and I think we need to be reminded that the radicals that are killing people are out there do not represent the whole Muslim world but in making that statement, he implied that there was a problem with, slave, with, with Christianity in regards to the Crusades and also slavery. And I think he really uh, probably didn't do uh, uh, what I felt like was justice to history. And I want to say a couple things before I get started here. History is really important because it affects our attitudes and how we look at the world and even how, how we uh, relate to other people. The facts of history are this. The Crusades were a response to hundreds of years of Muslim aggression. The Muslims basically performed genocide and wiped out most of the Christians and Jews in the northern part of Africa and Asia Minor. Today, I'm going to be talking about the missionary journeys of, of Paul. He was in Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And the church was strong there, and it was through the, the Muslim uh, genocide that the church was wiped out. And, it, and it, it continued through modern times. In 1915, the Armenian Christians, 1.5 million of them were slaughtered in Turkey. <clears throat> Horrible things. They took Muslim, they took Christian girls, dozens of them, and crucified them on crosses. It made what's look, what's happening today look like nothing compa in comparison. And so there's this thing with Hollywood, and there's this thing with with some uh, people that are teaching history. They want to gloss over the hundreds of years of of of, mu of Muslim violence. Uh, Islam spread through violence. Through, uh, through force of arms. If you read history and you look into it, you will be able to verify these things. The Crusades were a response to the Muslims taking over Spain and starting to attack France. That's what the Crusades were. And regarding slavery, it was cr Christian evangelicals who formed the anti-slavery movement. William Wilberforce and our own B.T. Roberts in America were uh, key figures in, in, uh, in going against slavery. If it weren't for the Christians, we may still have slavery here today. Christianity revolutionized not only how people treated slaves, but how women were treated and some other things. And as we get into church history, we're going to cover some of that stuff because I don't think we want to be ignorant of it because apparently there's a lot of people who are very ignorant of history or they want to redo history in a way that fits uh, their own ideas. But history needs to be based on I know there's interpretation in it, but we need to look at what happened and it needs to be based on some truth, the wit eyewitnesses, the accounts of what happened. So I think it's really important today that we have an understanding of history. And if you're out in the world and people mention the Crusades or they mention slavery being uh, the fault of Christianity, set them straight. Say, I don't think you've really looked into history very, uh, very much because I think you're going to find out that the story is a little bit different than what you get from the media. And uh, if you talk to historians who really know history, they will verify what I'm saying. Uh, you can read up on it. I've been reading up on it lately. Today we're going to talk about the Apostle Paul, the first world missionary. Paul started out with the name Saul, and he was a persecutor of the church. In Acts, it says he changed his name to Paul. It doesn't say why. Perhaps it symbolized to him that he was a different person after meeting Jesus Christ. 
An encounter with the risen Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus completely changed the direction of Paul's life. Now, I'm going to read uh, some lengthy uh, chapters of, or some lengthy uh, parts of Scripture today because I think I really need to. And I don't think I can say this any better, but I'm going to read the testimony of the Apostle Paul. It's found in Acts chapter 22. Wouldn't it be incredible to actually have Paul here to give his testimony? Well, maybe not that incredible because he would speak in Greek and none of us would probably understand him. I'm glad that the Greek uh, Bible that was the Bible that was originally written in Greek, or he might speak in Aramaic, which would be just equally as under not understandable. But I'm glad that it uh, was some folks saw fit to translate it into English. Now I'm reading. Uh, Acts chapter 22, and Paul is defending himself. He's going to become arrested. There was a riot in Jerusalem. He's defending himself by giving his testimony. He says, Brothers and fathers, listen now to my defense. When they heard him speak to them in Aramaic, they became very quiet. That was the language that they spoke back in Palestine at that time. It was the language of the Jewish people. Everybody else spoke Greek. Then Paul said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus of Cilicia, but brought up in this city under Gamaliel. I was thoroughly trained in the laws of our fathers and was just as zealous for God as any of you are today. I persecuted the followers of this way to their death, arresting both men and women, throwing them into prison, as also the high priests and all the council can testify. I even obtained letters from them to their brothers in Damascus and went there to bring these people as prisoners to Jerusalem to be punished. About noon, as I came near Damascus, suddenly a bright light from heaven flashed around me. I fell to the ground and heard the voice, a voice say to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord, I asked. I am Jesus of Nazareth, whom you are persecuting, he replied. My companions saw the light, but they did not understand the voice of him who was speaking to me. What shall I do, Lord, I asked. Get up, the Lord said, and go into Damascus. There you will be told all that you've been assigned to do. My companions led me by the hand into Damascus because the brilliance of the light had blinded me. <clears throat> A man named Ananias came to see me. He was a devout observer of the law and highly respected by all the Jews living there. He stood beside me and said, Brother Saul, receive your sight. And at that very moment, I was able to see him. By the way, Ananias had early, it's talked about, had earlier seen a vision or had a vision and was instructed to do that. Then he said, The God of our fathers has chosen you to know his will and to see the righteous one and to hear words from his mouth. You will be his witness to all men of what you've seen and heard. And now what, you're, what are you waiting for? Get up, be baptized, and wash your sins away, calling on his name. When I returned to Jerusalem and was praying at the temple, I fell into a trance and I saw the Lord speaking. Quick, he said to me, leave Jerusalem immediately because they will not accept your testimony about me. Lord, I replied, these men know that I went from one synagogue to another to imprison and beat those who believe in you. And though the blood of your martyr Stephen was shed, I stood there giving my approval and guarding the clothes of those who were killing him. Then the Lord said to me, I will send you far away to the Gentiles. So after his vi uh, vision, he was... he fell down and there was a bright light and he was blinded and he heard Jesus speaking to him and asking him why he was persecuting him. After that vision, he's, uh, Ananias lays his hands on him and his sight is restored and he's even filled with the Holy Spirit, it says. He began preaching Christ immediately to the Jews that were in Damascus. Uh, we, we learned from piecing this together from Book of Acts, and a lot of the history is also in the Book of Galatians. He started preaching uh, Jesus was the Messiah, the Savior to the people in Damascus. Remember, he was going there with orders from the Sanhedrin, the high court in, in Jerusalem, to arrest Jewish people in Damascus and have them thrown in prison for believing in Jesus. So instead, when he arrives, he uh, goes to these, to these uh, synagogues, and they're expecting him. They'd probably heard about about how he was a great leader and a persecutor or a person who was clamping down. They probably looked at it on this uh, sect of the, the Christians. Actually, they called them the way or the believers in Jesus as the Messiah. 
They'd heard about him, and he goes to Damascus, and instead he preaches and argues with them about how Jesus is the Messiah. And he creates such a conflict that they have to lower him down from the city wall in a basket because they were going to, some people had made a pledge to kill him. He escapes and he starts a pattern of missionary activity of preaching and then getting under persecution and then going to the next town. He went then from Damascus to the desert of Arabia to study and pray. Then he went back to Jerusalem where he stayed with the apostle Peter and also talked to James. He stayed 15 days with Peter. Now even though he was staying with Peter and probably Peter could have vouched for him, the apostles and the disciples in Jerusalem were afraid of him. He was the one that had dragged some of their friends and relatives into prison. And now he's coming back saying, I'm a Christian? Yeah, right. They figured it was just a ruse. And apparently there was a man who had great standing in Jerusalem by the name of Barnabas. He actually took Paul over to the apostles. Maybe they were in hiding. Maybe they didn't have permission for Paul to get there. <laughs> Um, but he took him and introduced him, and they accepted Paul's word and believed that he had truly converted to Christ. Now Saul was raised in Tarsus. In Acts 22, 3, it talks about that. We just read about that. Tarsus was located in the Roman province of Cilicia, now known as a part of modern Turkey. And uh, you can see that Tarsus is right down here. Jerusalem is right down here. It would take... Uh, a number of days, even by horse, to get up to uh, Tarsus. But Tars Paul was raised up there in Tarsus. And uh, Tarsus was kind of a, me a metropolitan-type city. It, in those days, it was a fairly large city. There might have been uh, uh, tens of thousands of people living in Tarsus. It was a modern city. It combined the Jewish and the Greek and the Roman cultures. And uh, so Paul would have been growing up in, exposed to different types of ethnic groups and different types of cultures. And uh, we know later on that he was fluent in several languages. He was fluent in Aramaic, which was the language they spoke among the Jewish people. He was fluent in Greek, and he also knew Latin. He was also, Paul was a Roman citizen. There weren't many people that were Roman citizens. That way means he was actually a citizen of the, of the city Rome, which was the capital of the empire which is way over there. Now, scholars have debated how did he get his Roman citizenship. He did, doesn't say in Scripture how he got his Roman citizenship, but perhaps it was because the people in Tarsus or pla a place where he grew up in may have done something outstanding to help the empire, and sometimes the empire would grant the citizens, all the citizens of the city Roman uh, citizenship. And that offered you the legal protections as a Roman citizen. You had a lot more legal protections than you did if you were just a citizen of Jerusalem or of uh, Egypt or, or Greece or someplace else. If you were a citizen of the city of Rome, you had all these legal protections. And there were times when Paul used those legal protections to save his life. It also allowed him to more easily travel from place to place in the Roman Empire as a Roman citizen. So he went from... Uh, uh, Saul went from Tarsus, and probably when he was a young man, most uh, uh, young men who were studying, would, when they were in their teen years, they would go down to, to study. He went down to Jerusalem, and he studied under Gamaliel. And Gamaliel was a student of, of Hillel, which is the greatest uh, scholar in all of uh, Jerusalem and all of history from the days of Christ to this day, the school of Hillel. And Gamaliel also established his school. He was the second greatest. So Paul is an up and coming uh, scholar, uh, very enthusiastic for uh, the Jewish culture, for the Jewish religion. And when he saw this, what he called it, what he thought was a cult of the uh, Israelite, of the Christians, he was used by the folks in the Sanhedrin to carry out their orders. And uh, even uh, probably had, was the one who had Stephen arrested and stoned. And it says in the scripture, another place that he, right here, that he held the coats of the people that stoned Stephen, the de first, one of the first deacons appointed by the church. Now, rabbis always picked their disciples, so Paul was a very honored leader. And, uh, but his life uniquely prepared him for what God had for him. Even uh, 
the bad things that happened to him in life. Uh, God used him through the bad things that happened in his life when he suffered such persecution. Have you found that to be true? You know, it's interesting, isn't it, that sometimes it's not just the great insights that we have from God that cause us to grow. A lot of times the time that we grow the most is when we're going through a very difficult time. We lean on God like we've never leaned on Him before. And um, when you're going through a time of extended uh, physical illness, up and downs, like Avina is going through right now. Uh, when you go through a time when you lose your job or you're looking for work or when you go through a time when you're being challenged with a physical ailment or a relationship problem that is just, you just don't know what to do about it. God uses those times in our life to kind of interrupt our life and then we focus and we reflect on God for a while and God reveals something to us that He wants how he wants us to change, to grow, to mature in him. And so Paul uh, went through all of these travels and all these uh, things that he went through, and God used him in a mighty way. In fact, God used his background, his cult, the culture that he was raised in, to help him to be uh, the person that could reach different cultures in, as a missionary. Even though his parents agreed to have him move to Jerusalem to study under the rabbis, maybe to get out of the culture, away from the pagan culture up in Tarsus. But that wasn't God's plan. God's plan was that he would be a missionary to this culture. Now, the Apostle Paul made three main missionary journeys. Now, back then, to travel was a harrowing experience, a dangerous experience. Um, if you read this uh, about Paul, you find out that he actually was involved in two different shipwrecks and almost lost his life many, many times. But Paul made three different missionary journeys. The first missionary journey, he, he was in Antioch at the time. He had gone up to Antioch with Barnabas. And he goes over to Cyprus, to Salamis, and then to Paphos. And at Paphos, Paul being a Roman citizen, which is really unusual, would give him access to the higher echelons of Roman life. And so he actually led uh, the leader of this city, the proconsul, Roman proconsul, uh, was converted to Christ. On Cyprus. And then he goes over <clears throat> into uh, the lower part of what's today Turkey, lower part which was called Asia Minor back then, to Perga, uh, and, and another th city called Antioch, but this is not this Antioch, which Antioch was a major city, may have had as many as half, half a million or a quarter million people. Uh, another Antioch, and he, there he encountered intense Jewish opposition to the gospel. The group that, that Paul had the most success in converting were uh, Greeks from the diaspora, is what they called it. And these were Greek people that had been chased out of, out of uh, Palestine or Jerusalem uh, during way back when the Babylonians took over the nation of Israel. And later on, 70 years later, the, uh, the nation of Jerusalem was reestablished under the Persians. But a lot of the people that were deported from Jerusalem to Babylon and went to, and other areas of the, of the world uh, never came back to uh, Jerusalem. And they learned Greek and they spoke Greek and they were part of the Greek culture and they, even their synagogues uh, worshipped in Greek. That group, group of people who were Jewish in culture and, and, and uh, background or Jewish in background but had accommodated themselves to, to Greek culture, that group of people which they call Greeks or Hellenists, those Jews were the ones that made up a lot of these churches or a lot of these synagogues that Paul was visiting. So he'd go into the Jewish synagogue and he would start telling them that Jesus is the Christ. Now you can imagine if I went across town to the Jewish synagogue and I said, well, I'm a Hebrew scholar. And they said, yeah, who you study under? I said, well, I studied under Gamaliel. Whoa, he's the foremost scholar. Let's have you speak. 
And I get up and I start talking about how Jesus was crucified and I go through the Old Testament scriptures and bring out all the prophecies about Jesus and, and uh, how he was supposed to die on the cross. I read Isaiah chapter 53. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. I go through all that. The leaders of the synagogue down there who don't believe the Messiah has come, they're saying, this guy is off his rocker. This is weird stuff. I heard that this stuff was going on in Jerusalem. This guy was executed because he was, a tre he was treasonous against the Roman Empire, this Christ. And so there would be a big uproar, probably a lot of arguments. Paul would be kicked out. And he would find somebody who was probably a Greek who was a little more open to this idea that Christ might be... Uh, the Savior. He'd stay in their home and then he would teach there for a while. Eventually they said, this guy's causing too much trouble. Too many people are being converted out of the synagogue and, and uh, then uh, they would uh, persecute him or get a riot going or they'd run him out of town. That was his church planting. I don't think it was Paul's church planting strategy, but that was God's strategy for the Apostle Paul. So up here there's opposition to the gospel and he gets kicked out. He goes to Iconium. Uh, there's a plot here in Iconium uh, to kill him, a secret plot to kill him, because they couldn't have the Romans execute him because he wasn't doing anything against the Roman law. Uh, and then he goes down to Lystra, and uh, the miracles happen uh, through them. Uh, and at, at Lystra, uh, they think he's a god, and they try to make him a god. And when he tells them they're not, then the Jews start persecuting him. He goes from being a god to being in danger of his life. That's the highs and lows of missionary activity under the Apostle Paul, okay? So then he goes to Derby, and uh, he goes back and he goes and visits, probably in some cases secretly, visits the converts, uh, and he, he goes back here. Now those missionary journeys are in just one chapter of the book of Acts, Acts chapter 13 through Acts chapter 14, actually two chapters there. The second missionary journey... Um, he, he, he uh, started out, he got all the way back to uh, Jerusalem, and uh, there's a Jerusalem conference there. He goes back to Damascus, where he, remember, he'd been let down on the wall there, and he talks and he preaches and he teaches there, has good success there. And then he goes back up to Antioch, and he stays there quite a while because there are many people coming to Christ in Antioch. And here on the second missionary journey in Antioch, first time that, that this new uh, group of people that followed Jesus were called Christians. That's where the word Christian came from, was from Antioch. They started calling them that, Christians. Before that, they simply referred to them as the way, the way to, to God. Um, there's a, by the way, there's a cult called the way that's not a Christian group nowadays. Not the same one. Um, anyway, um, he goes from there and he goes to, back to Tarsus and visited home and to Derby and, uh, and up in Lystra's where Timothy joins his work. So he goes, he had, he had gone right here and uh, right here and then come back again. Now he takes a bigger trip. He goes all the way to Troas. He decides he's going to do Asia Minor. Now Asia Minor was one of the most important areas in all the Roman Empire. And so at Troas, he probably was planning to go down through here and work his way back again, but he has a vision there of someone pleading him to go to Macedonia. Now Macedonia is Greece, basically where Greece is now. So he does a missionary journey into Macedonia, and there he has uh, a, a tremendous success at Philippi and Berea, and some of the places not so much success. At Corinth, uh, a, a strong church was established in Corinth. He may have stayed up to a year and a half in Corinth. At Ath Before he went to Corinth, he was in Athens, and he was preaching to the philosophers, the Athenian philosophers, uh, about the unknown God. And then he worked his way down then, and he went back to Ephesus. Had a tremendous um, response in, in Ephesus. And uh, uh, stayed there maybe almost uh, three years, and then he, he went back. Now, Ephesus was uh, also a place where there was a riot, and he got in trouble, and he almost got killed in Ephesus. Now, the third missionary journey... Uh, he went back to Jerusalem then. Starts out in Jerusalem, or no, wait a minute here. Where did he start out there? Start out in Antioch. 
So he's always, Antioch looks like it was his base, basically. And he goes back and he visits all the other churches. But this time, notice that he goes on the coast, which he was maybe originally planning to go on the coast when he was at Troas, go down there, he was, before he was called to Greece. So he goes on the coast and he tries to, and he reaches these churches here, and he visits the churches. Um, up in Troas, he, he, let, he restored life or raised somebody from the dead. And it's, it's like, well, it's kind of a little short section in Scripture. It's like, yeah, he raised someone from the dead that got killed. And that's just what he did. And then up in, ne in Neapolis and Philippi, and he goes back to these, to these other places here. And he goes back and visits the church in Corinth. Now, right here, he writes a letter down here, to, which is First and Second Corinthians. And that shows you that these missionary journeys took years, okay? And so he writes a letter to the Corinthians because they're going way off, okay, uh, into uh, a lot of the Pentecostal, things that we would probably call very Pentecostal, uh, ultra-Pentecostal kind of a things. And so he writes a letter to them to kind of, in 1 Corinthians 12 through 14, correct some of that. They also have a lot of immorality in the church. They're very excited about Christ. The church is growing, but it has a lot of pagan people coming into the church, and they're bringing a lot of practices in there. And so he writes a letter, which kind of prepares his way, and then he goes back, and he visits them, and he kind of straightens out the church there. Uh, so then he goes all the way back, and he goes all the way to Jerusalem. Now, while he's on his way back, twice there are different people uh, that prophesy that he better not go back to Jerusalem because he's going to be killed if he gets back to Jerusalem. But for some reason, Paul feels that God wants him to go, and he goes anyway. He goes back to uh, Jerusalem. Okay, next slide. And sure enough, there's, uh, he goes into the temple in Jerusalem and he, he cleanses himself and everything's fine. The Jewish people in Jerusalem, uh, the Jews that were in charge of the nation, uh, they had heard that Paul was uh, reaching all these Gentiles and, and they were also pretty upset because the Greek-speaking Jews were converting so many of them to Christianity. And uh, so when they find him in the temple, it causes a riot. And the Romans... Uh, uh, respond to this riot uh, and uh, they basically arrest the Apostle Paul and they're getting ready to beat him and he says, is it, is it okay for you to beat a Roman citizen? They go, oh no, this guy's a Roman citizen. So, uh, and then uh, a relative of, of Paul's goes to the, to the leader of the army there in Jerusalem and uh, I think his name was Lysias, and he tells him, he says, I heard there's a plot, a bunch of people said, we're not going to eat or drink until we kill Paul, and they're going to ask you to transfer Paul, and while he's being transferred, they're going to attack the column, and they're going to kill Paul. So he sends out a guard at night with horses and 100 cavalry, and Paul goes to Caesarea, which is the Roman capital of Palestine, and he stays there two years, okay? Because he, when he was in Jerusalem over here, he was afraid they were going to kill him. So as a Roman citizen, he has the right to appeal to Caesar. So he appeals to Caesar... And they have to have him go to Caesar. Now, Caesar has a backlog of years, okay? Because any Roman citizen doesn't like their judgment, they can appeal to Caesar. Plus, it's going to take them a while to get him there. So he stays in Caesarea for a couple years, and uh, first one governor, and then another governor sees him, and he almost converts them to Jesus. And eventually, they send him on his way, and uh, he, he visits uh, Myra and goes down here to... to uh, Crete and it is, it makes a stop there for supplies and, and uh, visits the people and evangelizes there. And on his way to Italy, there's a storm and the ship is lost in the storm and they wreck on the little island of Malta and they, they end up there and eventually they get a, another Roman ship and he goes on up to Rome. So that's the life of, of the Apostle uh, Paul. Now, in his travels, the Apostle Paul endured incredible persecution and suffering. He describes some of it in, in 1 Corinthians, uh, or in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I want to make sure that's 2 Corinthians instead of 1 Corinthians, because I wrote it down one place as 1 Corinthians, and one place as 2 Corinthians. 
2 Corinthians chapter 11, I think it's verses 24 through 26. Yeah, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 24 through 26. This is what he talks about, all the things that happened to him on his missionary journeys. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Now, the reason why they only got 39 lashes is because 40 would kill you. <laughs> they kind of had it worked out to a science, you know. And, and on average, 40 lashes or more, a lot of people die, so we better hold it to 39, okay? Five times, imagine. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was pelted with stones. Three times, or oh, three times I was shipwrecked. I stand corrected. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night, I think we only have a record of two shipwrecks in the book of Acts. Uh, I spent a night and a day in the open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, in danger from bandits, in danger from my fellow Jews, in danger from Gentiles, in danger in the city, in danger in the country, in danger at sea, and in danger from false believers. And he doesn't even mention all the times that he was beaten by crowds. That was kind of just normal occurrence for him. But he saw incredible results. Many churches were started. Many converts. God blessed his presence, his, his dedication uh, to sharing the gospel with miracles. And he had incredible revelations from God. In fact, he talks about these revelations and, and in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 through 9. He says, Because of these surpassingly great revelations... Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. He who had healed people, who had even raised someone from the dead, his own prayer, three times he prayed and it was not answered. He was not healed. Now, he doesn't say what that thorn in the flesh is. And, people, and that's what makes it kind of fun. You can speculate what that was, right? We, nobody, hard, hardly anybody believes it was an actual thorn in his flesh because you just pull it out, right? Something painful, something that continued to bother him. Some people have, some Bible scholars think that it was the thorn in his flesh was the Jewish people that continually persecuted him. But I don't think that he would pray three times and ask it to, to be taken away. I think he knew that when he went into the towns that he was likely to per be persecuted and that was part of God's plan. So I really don't think that's a good, I personally don't believe that. What I think is plausible, another theory is that he had some type of migraine headaches or some kind of problem uh, that was painful. Because in one place, he says to uh, the folks in, the, in, in Asia Minor, Laodicea, he says, you would have gladly, gladly taken your eyes out for me if you could have. And that description sounds to me like someone with migraine headaches because their eyes become blurry and they have tremendous pain in their head and in their eyes. And he prayed three times, but God didn't take it away. And he says he thinks the reason was so that he wouldn't be so uh, conceited. Uh, yeah, Paul, you heal other people, but you yourself are not healed. Why? I don't know. I just have to humbly say God does what he wants. You know, it's not me. It's God who does it. And uh, he had all these wonderful revelations. He had God using him in such great uh, ways, but God left him with an infirmity be so that his character would be fashioned. And, you know, sometimes God has reasons for the things that we have to put up with in our lives. S our infirmities, physical infirmities, even emotional infirmities and ups and downs that some people uh, physically and psychologically can't deal with. Sometimes God allows us to have those things to mature us in Christ and to develop us because His Spirit is so much more important than the physical from God's point of view, not necessarily ours because we live in the physical realm. And God uses the, the, these types of things, the terrible persecutions that Paul did and the different things that happened to him and even his physical problems. Paul used those, or the, God used those in the Apostle Paul. So he takes the things of our lives that are the most difficult and he uses them for his glory and to help us.
Paul cared deeply for the churches that he planted, and in those days where you don't have Facebook or email or phones, it, they were heavy on his heart. How are they doing? I wonder if they're still staying with Jesus or whether someone has come in like a wolf and among the sheep and has led them astray, and sometimes that did happen. So he writes these letters to correct some of the theology and some of the uh, bad things that were happening and some of the people that were trying to take the people away from Christ. He writes all these letters, which we call the the fancy word epistles, uh, these letters to the churches to follow up and help them. And a lot of, some of those letters were actually written while he was in prison. I think some of the greatest letters of the Apostle Paul were written while he was in prison. He it gave him some time to do it. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and, and, and Philemon were all written while he was in prison in Rome. Especially touching is Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 18. And when you read this, you realize this is a person who's in prison and he's not sure whether he's going to survive this prison or whether he's going to be executed. Awaiting trial by that cruel pervert Nero. Nero uh, blamed the Christians for the burning of Rome. Some scholars in the uh, historical scholars think that Rome wanted to do a revitalization project on downtown Rome and he couldn't get rid of the building so he himself had it set on fire and then he blamed the Christians for the fire because th at this time they were a small group of people and people think they're kind of weird. There's rumors that when they do the Lord's Supper that they actually engage in cannibalism. And so he blames the rumors on this small group of Christians that are in Rome because they're not politically strong and he can get away with it. And so Nero, who was so cruel and so perverse, he liked to, he built these huge extravagant gardens only for himself, not for the people of Rome. Uh, after the fire, he built these huge extravagant gardens and blaming it on the Christians, he would take Christians and he would impale them on a pole and he would burn them and use them to light his garden. Not many, maybe only a thousand Christians died under Nero. But that was the Nero that Paul had appealed to. Now, Paul appealed to him before Nero started persecuting the Christians. So he's writing this thinking, this is the guy that I'm going to go and I'm going to try to have to defend myself before him. But he did know that it might take years for him to, uh, for his case to come to Nero, unless Nero wanted to make an example of him. Here's what he writes in Philippians chapter 2 to the, to the gr group of believers, that church plan in Philippi that he had established. By the way, the church in Philippi was led by a woman, probably met in her home, Lydia. He said, Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. When we have little problems that we complain about or grumble and you hear about someone going through something like Paul went through, I think those words had pretty good impact on them, didn't they? Here he is, maybe, ha maybe facing going to Nero. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. But even if I am poured out like a drink offering on the sacrifice and service coming from your faith. He's referring to his death. If I should be poured out, my blood should be poured out. Even if that happens, I am glad and rejoice with all of you. So you too should be glad and rejoice with me. God used hardship to bless the church with these incredible letters of encourage, encouragement. If you are going through hardship, is God using you to bless others? Finally, he was imprisoned. Church tradition says that he died under Nero. And Nero was persecuting Christians. Now, we believe that he was probably beheaded because it was illegal for a Roman citizen to be crucified or to be burned or, any, or sent, sent into the lions like the other Christians were being, what, what was happening to them under Nero. 
Uh, and church, so church tradition also says that he probably was crucified. That was the tradition. We don't have documentation of that. That's just tradition, what's been typically said about him. Church tradition also thinks that Peter, and possibly even Peter's Chrysostom talks about this. He's one of the early church fathers. Also says that, he, that Peter and possibly Peter's wife died under Nero, the same uh, persecution. Now the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 19, he says, If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. Why did Paul endure these sufferings? Why did the early church endure them? In Galatians chapter 1, we have a clue. In verse 15, he says, But when God, who set me apart from birth and called my, be me by His grace, was pleased to reveal His Son in me, so that I might preach Him among the Gentiles. He says, um, he talks about the fact that he had persecuted the church, but God, by His grace, had forgiven him and called him and given him a mission. The reason why Paul did this, was willing to do this, is because he had experienced the grace of God, the favor of God in his life. So his response of love. In Colossians chapter 1, we see another reason why Paul went through all this. Verses 27 through 29. To them God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all His energy, which so powerfully works in me. He cared for the people. He wanted the people to be, become mature in Christ, to know Jesus Christ as He had come to know Him. And then in the Philippians, as he's looking at his death, we have these words of the Apostle Paul. And I'm going to end the message with, with these words. Philippians chapter 3, verse 4 through 14. We have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love you have for all the saints. The faith and love that's... Oh no, that's... That's the first uh, chapter. Verse, chapter 3, verse 4. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you will also appear with Him in glory. Put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature, sexual immorality, impurity, lust, evil desires, and greed, which is idolatry. Because of these, the wrath of God is coming. You used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived. But now you must rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. Do not lie to each other, since you've taken off your old self with its practices and have put on the new life, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its Creator. Here there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience. Bear with each other and forgive whatever grievances you have against one another. Forgive as the Lord forgave you, and over all these virtues put on love, which binds them all together in perfect unity. The reason why he did all this was so that we would become mature in Christ and he looked forward to one day there would be a resurrection. So he knew that even if his body was destroyed, that he would have eternal life. That was the power of Christ, the power of the resurrection, which so strongly worked within him. We can look at the Apostle Paul. We can emulate his life. We can use it as an example in some way. And we can count ourselves blessed that we don't have to go through all the stuff that he went through. But if it wasn't for him, who knows whether we would have heard the gospel. Because he was the first great missionary. He started it all. 
And through him and the people he discipled, the word of the Lord spread through the whole world. Next uh, week, Pastor Luke's going to be preaching about the church uh, in the next stage after the Apostle Paul, after the early, early church, what happened then. And you won't want to miss that. Uh, let's stand and have the worship team come. We're going to sing a song as we close this message today. and those we know and love who are sick and we're asking for your healing and for your peace we pray for those who are in need both us and those we know and love help those of us Lord who are worried about how they're going to provide for their families help us to trust you completely and then to follow your leading and your spirit to do everything that's within our power. 
Help us, Lord, to know when and how to share with others. Help us to know how to show your love best. Help us to take the example of the Apostle Paul, the amazing life that you led him through, and to be your missionaries to those around us through acts of self-sacrifice, words of truth, and our love. We have so many things in which we need you, Lord. And we have so many things we want to give thanks to you for. Please hear the silent prayers of each of our hearts now. things great and small. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Now receive this benediction. Go in the grace and peace of God to love and serve God by loving and serving one another. Amen.